Welcome to Bat Shit, a frank and funny look at living with mental illness. While we'll touch on several illnesses, Bat Shit is focused on those along the spectrum of bipolar disorders. I'm your host, Adam. And I'm your other host, Brad. And we're both bipolar. So strap in and let's see how bad shit we really are. Spoiler alert. Pretty damn bad shit. I'm going to take a bite of this kind bar. Now. <laughs> That's what this episode's about, you guys. Kind bars. <laughs> <laughs> this episode's topic, bipolar relationships, part two. Part two. Friendships. Friendship. Friendship. Who really needs friendship? Um, Yeah. Uh, I think we've we've talked about this in the past. How friendships are really hard. I what I've experienced again. I'm just speaking for myself. Friendships are really hard because trying to maintain a relationship that you assume is going to end at any moment not only requires a lot of um, mental energy, but you, you feel like you're pushing a boulder up the hill, right? Because yeah. it's like this is all going to come to naught. So why am I bothering? This person is going to hate my guts at some point. Yep. I, it doesn't matter how well we get along, how much fun we have, how much we love one another. Right. They're going to fucking hate me. Yeah. They're either going to hate me because I do some asinine thing when I'm manic, <laughs> or they're going to hate me because, God, I'm depressed, and everybody hates right. me when I'm depressed. Hey, uh, let's go back in time for a second. Um, wh- when you were younger. 65 million years. 65 million years. When you were riding dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, no. So when you were a kid, right? Like, I'm talking under 10. Did you have difficulty making friends? Or was it easy for you? I did, actually. You Which, had trouble? or I had trouble. Okay. Now that I think about it. I think when I was a kid, I was pretty shy. Okay. Didn't have a lot of social skills. You I still learned. don't. You still don't. Yeah. You're still yeah. lacking. I, just, I, I cover them with my uh, Captain America jaw. Oh, yes. Pretty sweet, <laughs> Mr. DeVito. Keep going. <laughs> Mr. DeVito. <laughs> Return our calls. <laughs> please, please, <laughs> Danny. Um No, uh yeah, so when I was when I was a young kid I had some friends, mm-hmm. but I was kind of I guess had like social anxiety. Okay. How did that manifest? Um just the idea of talking to people that I didn't know okay. scared the hell out of me. Um, part of that was, you know, circumstances of my childhood and the way I was raised. My grandparents raised me and they were very much of a generation of like children should be seen and not heard. Kids didn't talk to adults. Right. You know, if you went into a shop or something like, you know, they, they talked to the adult about what you needed, uh, which is something I've tried to be very cognizant with my kids. I make, make them talk to anybody. Like, right. Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. You know, I took my kid to get a haircut the other day. I was like, tell her what you want. Exactly. When you take him to buy that, his first six pack, it's like, nope, come on. Talk to the man behind the counter. It's like, make sure you tell him it's Penthouse, not Hustler. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Um, You're Brad's son. Be Brad's son. Daddy, I'm seven. (laughs) Penthouse, not Hustler. (laughs) Uh, Don't make me repeat myself again. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but it it was when I got older, probably about middle school, when I really developed my sense of humor. Mm-hmm. That I started making uh, a lot of friends, um, and a lot of those friendships ended up burning on the altar of my mania. Because <laughs> um, it's like you said, it's difficult for people with bipolar to maintain any kind of relationship whatsoever. Right, right. Whether that's romantic friends, I mean, hell, work relationships. Oh God, yeah. Don't don't get me started on that. Yeah. Um, it's it's funny because I actually had. I'd say up until, oh, I don't know, third or fourth grade. So, like, prior to really being cognitively aware, you know what I mean, is how I'm going to phrase that, right? Because that's, like, seven, eight years old, right? Prior to that, like, you're not truly aware of who you are, right? Or you're not truly aware of your social standing, your social surroundings, right? I had no problem making friends. And I look back on it, and I think it's because I never stopped. Like, I never stopped to actually connect with anyone. I was, I felt, I kind of attributed it to myself like a vaudeville-style comic. Like, as long as I don't slow down, right? As long as I make joke after joke after joke after joke, yeah. be that physically or verbally or whatever, and 
I just keep getting a reaction from other people, I consider that I'm connecting with them, right? As long as a right. reaction occurs to whatever I'm doing, I've connected with this person, check, move on, yeah. right? Which is now looking back on it, it's such a twisted way of viewing relationships, right? Because just getting a reaction from someone does not... Uh, uh, this does not equal <laughs> relationship. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Brad's trying to like take cashews out of a bag without making noise. Without making too much and noise. It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, and then and then I hit the point where I started being cognitively aware, and I and I, I recognize the fact that me just being a jackass physically, you know, verbally to elicit reactions out of people like that kind of class ca- clown type of energy. Yeah. Wasn't who I really was. You know, it's like I wasn't. I was I was a reader. I was someone who enjoyed being introspective. I was all of the relationships I made dissolved and they disappeared. And they were all surface. Cuz they were all surface. Exactly. Yeah. Because that's not on the people I connect. I connected with. I keep using air quotes. You guys can't see like I'm on fucking TV or something. Um, I'm not actor Brad. I'm not on TV. Uh, Did somebody <laughs> say my name? No, 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 no. Put him back in his Put cage. Him back in the cage. God damn it! Somebody <laughs> um, chain him up. Right. Because and it's not on the people that I connected with. It's on me, right? Because I started realizing, oh, this isn't a real relationship. I should delve deeper. Crickets, crickets, <laughs> crickets. How the hell do you do that? Right. Yeah. And then and this is what's really fucked about it. From like, let's say fourth, fifth grade all the way to high school. Very few, if any, friends. Then I got to like sophomore year of high school and we talked about this in previous episodes. I adopted what is best described as a mask of like a socially acceptable, successful person. And I started making friends again. The only difference between that and when I was a kid was I was better able to slowly transition into real connections. Yeah. Yeah. And it it's a trip. It's a trip when you go back and you look at it. Now, looking back on your life, when do you think your bipolar started? After the war. No, um... (laughs) That's real. The year was 2072. <laughs> the machines have taken over. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> that's a great question, and I honestly don't know, because I have these memory gaps. I have these massive gaps. Yeah. And I don't, I just, I don't know. I have flashes of these periods of time in my life. I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess, Fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And that's strictly based. Really? That early? I'm guessing. I have no fucking clue. And here's why. That's when I noticed, or my parents noticed, a serious shift in my demeanor. And my my proclivity to social interaction. and, and And I don't know if that's just because that was Adam adapting to his new like mental uh, uh, awareness. But I know that my tendencies towards bipolar started then because I remember going like a week of, I came home from school. I disappeared into my room. I did not come out of my room until dinner. Then I went right back into my room. And I, and that's the only reason I came out for dinner was because my parents made me type of situation. Yeah. And then I was like, calling everybody i knew to hey man let's go play basketball let's go play football let's fucking shoot the shit video games what do you say you know it's like that's when i started noticing some of the tendencies as far as i can again as far as i can remember and i think that's that's the most frustrating thing because i want to be as honest as i can on this podcast and i struggle to do that not because i'm trying to lie to you because i don't i don't have a good recognition recollection of of when this shit happened yeah i mean can you pinpoint when you think your bipolar started developing not not being aware of it obviously you know that didn't happen until really recently but like truly developing because i think high school 
Okay. Because you experienced a lot of childhood trauma. Yeah. There were a lot of things that I did as a kid that would come up again in my bipolar. So it kind of makes it difficult to really parse. Now Adam is going for the cash. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I was trying, I'm like, I'm away from the mic. So right, sorry, yeah, this keep... is the the third episode we've recorded tonight. That's how we've, you can tell. We've had a lot of scotch. Yeah, you we're, can tell. We're snacky. Yeah, the, the, the episodes that you hear us eating. That's, yes. Uh, those are the, like the last episode we recorded that night. Yeah. So we got uh, we got cashews. We got pistachios. We got some country ranch almond nut thins. Um, by Blue Diamond. So Blue oh, Diamond, right. if you're you want to sponsor. If you're listening and want to sponsor. <laughs> like and, uh, that, like Kirkland, uh, what is this? Kirkland Nut Bars. Yeah, we can't also, afford Kind Bars, guys. This is like <laughs> Costco Bars. So if you're listening, Kirkland, and you'd like to sponsor. Mr. Kirkland. <laughs> Sorry, you, you were saying. Jeff Kirkland. Jeff Kirkland. <laughs> so there were a lot of things that we were actually talking before we started recording tonight. Is that I feel like when I go manic, I have a lot of childlike behavior. The lying, for instance. We've talked about lying before when I'm super manic. And a lot of the lying is about trivial shit. um, The way a child lies. And some of it is about like, like, oh, look at me. Aren't I cool? Like, I'm doing this thing that I'm not actually doing. Or this person's into me that's not actually into me or whatever. In the way that a kid would. Right. Um, and so it's kind of hard to parse, like looking back on like what was just those fucked up childhood behaviors because of my horrible upbringing. Um, and when did the bipolar start? I think, though, that the bipolar started when I was in high school. I feel like that's when I seriously started having depressive episodes. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> and that's when I can I can remember anyway specific manic episodes that I would have, and that's also when I started tanking friendships. Okay, um, and like you said, I always had a hard time connecting with people. Yeah, even when I had friends, it was kind of that surfacey level. This person I can make laugh, right? Well, that's so just therefore it. I will hang out with them. Even even today, I have a lot of. People I consider friends. Yeah. At the same time, a lot of it is kind of surface level. <clears throat> that doesn't mean I don't care about these people, but we haven't really dived deep. Yeah. And like it, it's like quantity over quality with me. I've always been like that. Yeah, me and too. It's, it's difficult for me to connect with someone. And so when I do have a strong connection with someone, it's hard for me to give it up. Sure. Like it means a lot to me. Especially when you connect with someone to the level where you can be really vulnerable with them. That's really hard to let go. Well, and I think part of that is is shared experience, right? Yeah. And because your experience is truly unique, right? And everyone listening to this, your experience is truly unique. So you feel like, and again, I'm not speaking for you. I'm speaking for myself. I'm just using the royal uh, uh, pronouns. Um <clears throat> you feel like in order to connect with someone, you need to meet someone who's been through what you've been through or experience what you've experienced, right? It's interesting you say that because my best friend in high school, Micah, his mother had also died when he was young. She died in a car accident. Um, and, uh, and we were really close in what probably became an unhealthy way. But that's another one. Like, I went manic and just totally fucked that up. Yeah. Um. Basically acted like, like he got a girlfriend after high school that he started spending all of his time with, which is pretty normal. That's what happens. Yeah. And for some reason, I felt betrayed that he wouldn't hang out with me anymore. Mm. Um, I like blew up on him. Really? And stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Total like manic, like not only manic, but like. Dealing with all those abandonment issues. Right. And right, right, right. It manifested into this. Yeah. Because it's like you were, I connected with you. We were close. Right. Like we're supposed to be brothers. You know, now you're going to leave me for a piece of tail. <laughs> piece know? of tail. Yeah. Gross. Um, that was back That was back when uh, guys bandied about phrases like bros before hoes. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, your Ed Hardy shirts. Um, <laughs> but, but that's the interesting thing, too, is because I would awful, if I wanted to force a connection, I would 
sometimes invent. This is when I was younger. I would invent shared experiences or shared connection with someone. Like I'd be like, you felt this way when this happened, right, man? Like now that's that's why we connect on so many levels. I'm not going to ask you about your experience. I'm not going to try and relate to you and what you went through. I'm going to assign you my personal perspective, and that's how I'm going to connect with you. You know, it's yeah. it, it, it's it's like when you and I reconnected over being bipolar, it was you being like, I'm bipolar. And I'm going, I'm bipolar. Conversation, you know, started, right? Right. As opposed to me going to, you know, my buddy Paul and being like, hey, bro, I know you feel exactly like this when I'm like this. So let's talk about it. And he has to, you know, try and because he is my friend, he has to try and relate and associate. Right. And But he doesn't have that experience. And he can't. And so therefore, I'm sitting there going, what's wrong with you, man? Why can't you fucking relate to me? All because mm-hmm. I'm forcing my perspective onto him. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's twisted. It really is. We're, and we're that, broken people. I yeah, think we've said that before. We'll say it again. Completely broken. Completely broken. Broken people. and shattered. And pistachios, you know, you can do nothing for us. <laughs> I've got pistachio crumbs all over my shirt. <laughs> I'm an adult. I'm an adult. Um, yeah. It's it's hard for people who are bipolar to maintain any kind of relationship. Because you there's basically three of you. You have the normal you. Mm-hmm. You have the manic you. And you have the depressed you. Mm-hmm. And whichever person that friend connected with right. and likes is not around all that often. Right. Because and, there's three of you. And, and oftentimes. Or if you want to count the mixed state guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's not. I will say 75% of the time when you make friendship style connections, I almost guarantee you you're in the manic state. Yeah. Like I, you, you, you will probably be in a manic state because that's when you're charismatic. That's when you're outgoing. That's, that's when, when you're, you're funny. Yeah, you're charming. Um, and then you can't keep that up anymore because you run out of energy and you have to. You fall into a depressive state, and that person's like, "What happened?" Like you know, I think you said this at one point in time, one episode. You're like, "What happened to that fun guy I used to hang out with?" It's like, yeah, oh. talking about how how we trauma dump on our female friends. Yep. Which God, I have a long history of. Um. I think we talked about this on uh, on Brad Interrupted. Brad Interrupted. But how the the course of recovery and treatment, et cetera, for all this is you're you're constantly growing. Yep. You're constantly realizing these little things about yourself and, and trying to fix them by realizing them. And that's one of the ones that I had to realize is because I feel comfortable, more comfortable with a woman, when I make a connection with a woman, whether that's as a friend or a romantic partner, I'm like, hey, hey, come here, come here. Blah! Here's all my horrible <laughs> shit. But, this is every sad thought I've ever had. Can I cry on your shoulder? But I also think that's like that's how we view male um, um, connections versus female connections, right? Like it's the, difficult to be vulnerable with another man. Right, because the idea is... I mean, even what we do. Like, you and I are incredibly vulnerable here, mm. but we got to fucking laugh about it. We have to laugh we about gotta it. We got to drink yeah. our scotch yeah, yeah, yeah. and we got to crack some jokes. There's been a number of times when we've made a joke and the other person has called us out on it. Like, no, 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 bro. What you just said's not healthy. Like, really dive into that. It's... Yeah. But yeah, to be emotionally vulnerable with a friend, and again, I'm going to make a generalization, but oftentimes people's closest friends are members of their own sex. Yeah. And as men, again, I'm only speaking as a man trying to connect with other men, you know, no social interaction or gathering or um, uh, a trope that has to do with male uh, relationships has to do with being vulnerable. Not a single fucking one. Like, let's talk about women for a hot second. Like, my wife all the time has girls over to- For pillow fights? Yeah, yeah, pillow fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the feathers are going everywhere. What Uh, what do they wear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you all about it later. (laughs) Um, But no, they, they. she will have women over to watch movies that make them feel good. And they'll reconnect over past experiences and- and oftentimes, yes, in a comedic sense, but it is it is very much like women connecting on an emotional level, right? 
Because yeah. these, these movies that they often watch are emotional. Like they have to do with, and again, this is generalization, but like you want to talk rom-coms, you want to talk like uh, uh, dramas, you know. Uh, uh, Whereas guys can only connect through an activity. Right. Or or a, a film or a TV show that is purposefully distancing. Like, yeah. for instance, if I invited you over to watch Predator, would you come? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. It's fucking Predator. Yeah. But at no Get point- Get to the chopper. <laughs> Get to the chopper. Come on. At no point during Predator are you and I going to look at each other and be like, man, I had a rough day. <laughs> <laughs> like like when Jesse the Body Venture is like, I ain't got time to bleed. Exactly. I'll be like, Adam, Adam, <laughs> my wife said something to me today. It really hurt. <laughs> you, buddy. <laughs> on the on the other hand, like I I have been at home when my wife's been watching these movies with their friends, and they'll fucking pause the movie to talk about something that affected them in the movie or reminded them of something that occurred. Yeah, that doesn't doesn't happen in Commando. I mean, should it? Of course it should. Like, yeah. there's so much to talk about in Commando. But and you know that is a good thing. Like with my realization that I used to tend to trauma dump on my female friends. Mm-hmm. A, I don't do that anymore. Not that I'm not vulnerable with them and talk about things. I don't trauma dump. Right, right, right. You have you have um, um, uh, boundaries, right? But also, I'm more open with my male friends. Okay, those who are closest to me, especially get, since getting diagnosed. Um. Well, and let me ask you a question: Do you feel like your social circle shrunk after you got diagnosed and started talking about it? Oh, completely. Yeah, completely. And that's kind of a bitch of it. And you guys listening have probably gone through this or may go through this. Some people can't take it. Nope. Um, they don't. They don't want to put in that emotional labor. They're scared of it. Maybe they. Maybe they don't believe it's real. Sure. We've talked about that. Is it's like again? It's it's hard to, especially when you're on the outside, to look at someone behaving with a mental illness Mm -hmm. and be able to parse what behavior is them and what is the mental illness. Right. You know, but I mean, I had, we talked about this in the first episode, one of my oldest friends, like this is somebody I've been friends with since high school, just fucking ghosted me. Yep. After I got diagnosed, haven't heard from them since. And, um, you know, probably never will. No, probably not. And, um, you know, it it hurts, but it, you it's, know it's a lot to deal with. It is, but yeah. you, you know what's funny is as we were talking about this, I just thought of something. I have been more open with my diagnosis with the people I work with than I have with my friends. Really? Yeah, I know that's that's odd to say, to say, but mm-hmm. like there there are a number of times when like I've sat there and been like, hey. um, I have to go to my therapy on Thursdays because I'm bipolar. You know, it's like, that's what I do. And, you know, my coworkers have been like, okay, sure. Like, I don't believe there's been any judgment. Maybe there has been and I wasn't aware of it. Um, Or, you know, if I have a really depressive episode and, you know, I'm, I'm hard to reach or I'm not as communicative, I will say, hey, look, guys and girls, I'm bipolar. I was having a bad episode. That's why I was less than communicative. And I think back on it, I'm like, is that because I feel like I need to justify that from a work perspective? But with my my friendships or my other relationships, I don't feel the need to justify it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sitting Maybe. there going, I got to keep my job. Yeah. Therefore, I have to explain to my boss <coughs> in some respect why I was a little deficient in my obligations right meanwhile if i sit there and i don't talk to brad for a week and a half my expectation even if it's inflated is that brad's just gonna understand and figure it out right yeah yeah right even if the relationship isn't that deep because that's the other twisted part about it oh my god i'm going down a rabbit hole but think about this for a second right like we form these relationships often inflated in our minds with other people, right? Like we're sitting there going like, this person's the greatest. This person loves me. This person, whatever, in our manic state, right? Right. Then we go into a depressive state and we go, I don't want to talk to you at all, but they're the greatest person in the world. I love them. They love me. They're going to understand it. Yeah. They're going to relate to it. They're going to accept it. And when I come out of this, they're going to be okay with it. Then we come out of it in the surface level relationship that we've created that person's not there anymore. They're fucking in the wind. Yeah. 
and you're like, oh my God, I'm fucking shit. The person who is my best friend in my mind, the person who I've connected with the deepest in my mind, just walked away from me because I am who I am. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And because because you're sick. And that that hurts a lot. That hurts, right? You know? And then you're like, and why it's... should I try connecting with anyone else ever again? Right. Even though that connection that you thought you were seeking or that you thought you had wasn't deep to begin with because yeah. of, you know, your tendencies to create surface level relationships. Yeah. God is so fucking secular. It makes me sick. Well, Sickly secular. And I can chart. I can go back now, now that I know I have this, and tell you every friend that I lost because of this illness. Or every every serious friend. Again, I had I don't connect with people easily. Mm. So when I connect with someone, it tends to be a strong bond. And so I have a lot of best friends who I just fucking ruined it. Um I'll tick through them now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I was in sixth grade, I mean, I, I'm going to use everybody's first names here. I don't know if you all listen, so apologies. Wouldn't that be interesting if they did, though? If, like, for instance, someone from your, like, deep past, yeah, they're like, oh, my God, Brad has a podcast? I remember <laughs> Brad from fucking sixth grade. Let's see what he... Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be. So, uh, Devon. So Devon and I became best friends in sixth grade because we both loved Spider-Man and Ninja Turtles. Oh, that's fair. And we stayed friends throughout high school. And um, and after, like when I was bouncing at that nightclub, I got Devon a job there. We were friends. And I started dating this chick. And she was not a good person. Um... <laughs> Why are you laughing about her not being a good person? <laughs> so on a side note... Me and another guy, after after this chick and I broke up, we were really into absurdist humor, and we were driving down the street, and we came across a dead raccoon. Oh, no. And so we, we, we picked it up with a shovel, drove to her house, put it on the top of her car with a little sombrero and a bowl of salsa. <laughs> what? I was what obviously was fucking manic <laughs> as shit. Um <laughs> I'd forgotten about that until that. That's fun. That's weird. Yeah, but fun. <laughs> I mean, it's fun weird. Like, she probably came out of her house and was, like, scared, but at the same time, like, giggling inside because of how weird that was. So, uh, uh, Stephanie with an F. Um, right there. Red flag. Yeah. Should have been a huge red flag. <laughs> uh, she started, like, hitting on my friends behind my back. Um, she had a lot of issues. Um. But uh, so she she started doing this with Devon, and I was manic as shit, and I blamed Devon for it. Oh. And we got in a huge fight, and um, we really haven't talked since. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, he was he was like my best friend in the world for years, you know. Do you, um, do you keep tabs on him at all? Because uh, he's from back home, so yeah, yeah no, people. I you know we have a mutual friend Ross, and I Ross had run into him at some point, and I was like, oh, I, how's he doing? He's like, ah, he's okay, and uh, he's like, he hates you though, <laughs> and I was like, well, that tracks. Yep. <laughs> um, and then there was Micah, who I talked about, um, destroyed that. Then uh, I was doing improv comedy in Knoxville with uh, with this guy Josh. And uh, ended up uh, when I moved to Birmingham on accident, right. <laughs> when my car broke down, um, to be with my wife. Uh, Damn, Shannon, ruining <laughs> friendships. <laughs> uh, I convinced uh, Josh to come down with me. We formed a sketch comedy group together, and then Josh got to the point where he wanted to quit the group for whatever reason, and like I was manic as fuck and saw that as a betrayal. Okay. And yeah. so, like, blew up on him and, like, ostracized him. It was like, basically, like, nobody can talk to Josh and all this shit. It was just total, like, batshit stuff. Josh and I have actually, like, I mean, we're not, I wouldn't say we're friends again, but, like, we're friendly now, at least. Um, and, uh, and I've actually been meaning to call him and be like, be like, hey, man, I'm bipolar. Let me, let me explain this to you. Enjoying batshit? Please like, subscribe, and share it on social media. If you have someone you think may need to hear it, 
we encourage you to share it with them and to start your own conversation about mental health. Can I ask a, a tough question? Yeah. How many of these relationships, and I know you have more, do you feel like we're real connections as opposed to things that you... These are the ones... So that's what's funny. So the surfacey mm-hmm. relationships, I never did this shit with. It was these people I like really connected with. Interesting. Yeah, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if there's a part of my brain who is just comfortable being like, like, here's my fucking crazy. Let me let it out. I don't know. Um. So... Okay, one of my one of my best friends, uh, Lauren, when I was like nineteen, male or female? If you don't mind me asking, female. Okay, um, not that it matters. I'm just curious. Yeah. So, I and I've, I, I've, I've never stopped feeling horrible about this. Her mother died, mm. and you know, obviously, I had my thing with my mother, and instead of being like the friend I should have been for her. I like made it about myself. Ooh, right. right. Yeah. I was 19 and I was obviously like, man, yeah, I yeah, yeah. had that grandiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this is the Brad show. Mm-hmm. Hey, you guys are all just guest stars. Right. So like if, if, you know, if one of the side characters on the show, if, if they experience a death, it has to be to reflect yeah, on the yeah, main yeah. character. I know you experienced a death, but let me tell you about the death I experienced. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. And I've always felt horrible about that. And I actually reached out to Lauren after getting diagnosed and she was like, I don't even remember that. I've never had any ill will toward you. Fuck. Isn't that the worst part? Yeah. When, when you're like these, th- these moments that in your mind blew up a relationship or tanked a um, experience, people don't even register. They're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, I'm like, no, no, no. This is burned in my fucking psyche forever. And you don't even remember? Yeah. You don't remember? Yeah. It's funny how the brain works that way. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny because we've, I'm sure we've we've all done this, everyone listening. We'll run into an old acquaintance who is like, oh, hey, Brad, it's me. Hey, Brad, so great to see you, Brad. And you're like, I don't track who you are at all yeah. i don't know who you yeah. are but clearly to that person the experience that you shared was was important. was important right and and i think that's that's one of the really fucked up parts about the memory um loss that we experienced not memory loss that's the wrong word um how do you refer you phrase memory, I, I call it a memory gap memory gap the memory yeah. gaps we experience because like there are definitely moments when I am manic as fuck and I'll have these experiences with men women like friendships um uh, relationships whatever and then I'll see them again they're like oh my god it's so great to see you and I'm like what did we <laughs> yeah. like what, what was did we it do? yeah what was it For that real? happened he's like, she's like don't you remember the kidney you gave me i'm like that scar that explains <laughs> that the scar so <laughs> don't you remember that time that we went looking for an old pirate treasure <laughs> <laughs> we were in goonies i didn't realize we were in goonies damn yeah so okay so i'm gonna keep ticking through these oh sorry yeah, yeah keep going <laughs> i interrupted you like halfway through yeah so uh no 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 keep interrupting me because that's where the jokes come in is that how comedy works? I think so. Uh. <laughs> um, so about the same time, my I, I was friends with uh, this this chick, Sean. Sean uh, dated my friend Charlie. Neither of them had a car, so I would go pick Sean up and take her to Charlie's, and then when I'd bring her home, like we'd hang out, and, like watch movies and listen to music mm. and like cook and stuff. And we just became like best friends. Uh, she was brilliant. Like, I think she spoke like three languages, like wow. read like a book a day. Woo. Um, she reads. Yeah. And like gorgeous. Um, just the really, I remember the most like beautiful blue eyes. Like I've never seen the shade of blue on anyone. Ever cool. Again. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, I ended up breaking up with my girlfriend. She broke up with Charlie. We continued hanging out. I go into a manic state, lose my job, get another job, lose that job. <laughs> Impressive. Start getting, start getting in a bunch of fights, you know, just great behavior. Mm-hmm. Showing up at parties. So this is apparently a common manic behavior, especially in young people. Go on. Um, and to the point where when I read it, I, I just could laugh because I would do this. I started showing up uh, like I'd drive my convertible. Like I, it wasn't a cool convertible. It was, <laughs> it was a Dodge Shadow. Oh, that's it. It was like a, <laughs> what's that Jetta that, uh, that uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry. It wasn't no, even no, as cool Volkswagen. as that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it wasn't even as cool as that. Uh, it was basically like a uh, 
I don't know, like if you imagine a Chrysler that somebody cut the top off. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sunglasses uh, at night. Yeah, exactly. So I would drive that thing naked because I thought that was hilarious. What? Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I would never sh- experienced that. Keep yeah. going. No sh- judgment, just have an experience. I'd show up to parties wearing nothing but an apron because I thought that was hilarious. That's funny. But that's apparently really common in manic states, especially in young people, is to want to be naked in public. Really? Yeah. They they think a lot of like streaking and stuff. That, that was the origin of it. Interesting. Um, is it? Can I just stop for uh, yeah. pause? You every time you mention a manic episode that you have. I lean forward because I want to have experienced it as well yeah. to not feel as alone. Well, you know, you know, since I got diagnosed bipolar one instead of bipolar two, I experienced full blown mania and bipolar two, you're experiencing hypomania. And that's just it is like yeah. you'll describe these events and these you know experiences that I, I, I experienced like maybe a fraction of what you've gone through. You know what I mean? Like, I can associate, but I cannot relate. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But No, uh, back it's, to- it's, it's interesting how it's kind of the same illness, but just to different degrees. Right. I mean, it's the same way when you talk about depression. Like, I've experienced bad depression. I haven't experienced depression like you. Mm, right. You know, which is, again, a, a hallmark of bipolar 2 versus bipolar 1. In, in bipolar 2, it tends to be, not always, but it tends to be the depression is worse. Mm. And in bipolar 1, the mania is worse. Mm, interesting. Um, so sorry. So Sean yeah. naked at a party. So uh, yeah. So anyway, I I'm going into full blown manic state. As we talked about before, it's common when you're manic to think you've fallen in love. Sure. Because you have all the love hormones, the oxytocin, the serotonin, the dopamine's just flooding your brain. And if you don't know you're bipolar, you're like, what's causing this? That person that, must be calling. Mm, yep. Me. Um. And so I think I fall in love with Sean. So I tell her, and it puts a big strain on her friendship. Sure. But for some reason, she still wants to hang out with me. Yikes. And um, so we continue hanging out, and then we're laying in her bed one night talking, and uh, and she's like, would you like to kiss me? I'm like, yeah. Yes, I would like to do that. (laughs) So we're kissing, and then things progress, and uh, I get really weird because I'm manic, and I say some shit that I think is funny, but it's kind of hurtful. Um. And I feel like I'm being like jokey, playful. But right, but I'm not. She I'm does being, not view it that way. I'm being a dick. Yep. So come the next day, she wants to pretend like nothing ever happened, and that's kind of where we're at. And that's so our, our friendship at this point. I'm full blown manic. I'm lying. I'm doing all the shit I've talked about. I do when I'm manic before. Um, and uh, she ends up. Her parents were divorced. Her dad uh, was moving to Toronto. Or lived in Toronto, I forget. But she was going to move in with her dad. So it comes the day she's going to leave. She wants all of us to come over to say goodbye. Again, I make it all about me. Of course. Because I'm manic as shit. Grandiosity. It's the Brad show. God um, damn you, actor Brad. God damn it, actor Brad. Somebody say my name. Fuck off. Fuck you, actor Brad. Shut the door. <laughs> um. So, uh, yeah. So she leaves, goes to Toronto. We don't talk for a while. Then we start talking on the phone, and uh, things seem to be getting back to like where they used to be. And then, uh, then I go manic again, and out of the blue, I'm like, "I'm going to fly to Toronto to see her. It's a grand romantic gesture." Of course, she doesn't see it that way, and of course, she's right. Right, it's not. Um, it's not a grand romantic gesture. So, uh, so I stay with her, and we actually we end up having like a good time for a little bit, and you know, kind of there's some flirty stuff there. Um, and, uh, then we get in a big fight and I walk 20 miles to the Toronto airport at 3 a.m. They have taxis in Canada. It's manic as shit. Got it. And I think it was broke. Fair enough. Um, you did fly to Toronto. That's true. Um, at like 19 or something. Yeah. No. Yep. You're broke. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I, uh, yeah, fly back to the States and that was it. We hadn't talked since. She did send me a letter. And the letter said, uh, there's, there's something that stuck out to me in the letter. It was, I've never had more fun with another person than I do with you. I've never felt closer to someone than I do to you. And you ruin it over and over again. Yeah. And we hadn't talked since. And then when I got diagnosed, I, uh, sent her a private message on Facebook because that was the only place I knew to contact her. It was just like, Hey, Turns out I'm bipolar. I'm sorry about what happened. Your friendship meant a lot to me. I was in a bad place at the time, and that was one of the the only good memories I have. 
you know, and, and just kind of wanted to make amends. And I saw that she read it, but she never responded. And, you know, that's her prerogative, and that's, yeah. you know, okay. I mean, I don't, like, I wasn't expecting to be, like, best friends again. No, of course shit. not. It's... I just, like we've talked about before, you just want people to understand. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like, even if you can't repair those relationships, which you can't. No. Like, even if it was your, even though it was your illness, you still did that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't expect the other person to forget that shit. Or even forgive it, you know? Right. But you just want them to understand that it wasn't you. It was this thing wrong with your brain i think it's i think it's tough because going back to what i mentioned before how someone will come and be like hey brad it's me remember that moment like you're you're affecting these people these friends in your life you're creating these moments these scars on their brains and eventually you know you figure out you're diagnosed bipolar and you're able to justify that scar Right, you were able to say, "Hey, this is why that scar was created." That doesn't change the fact that you've scarred this other person, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that and that sucks. And I'm I'm sorry for anyone I've scarred. I I'm sure I will scar in the future. Uh, because that's the other part of it is that I am still to this day figuring out. Like, like trying to rein in these impulses I have to, to trauma dump on people or to misread situations for a romantic, uh, 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 feeling. Like, obviously, I'm married now. I'm not going to make moves like that. But, but you still sometimes feel the feelings. Of course, you feel the feelings. You're like, what the fuck is happening? Um, which then causes me to push these people away for no reason, and they don't know why. Yeah, it's it's so fucked. Yeah, it's totally fucked. You know, we should have called this podcast totally, fucked. totally, fucked. totally fucked, totally fucked, totally fucked, totally fucked. An exploration into bipolar. Yeah. And then we wouldn't be competing against the Batman podcast. Bat- God damn you, Batman. <laughs> Why are you so engaging? If you're interested in Batman, there's another podcast called Batshit. So. I said, and the funny thing is, I don't think they've released an episode in like five years or yeah. something like that. And that's not a dig on Batshit. I haven't listened to it. It's just. But it still st- comes up number one. And you stole all of our fucking social media handles, bruh. <laughs> Let him go. Let him You're go. You're not bro. recording Just anymore. Just walk away. Just, Just walk don't away. Fucking walk away. <laughs> Just walk away. Leave the oil. Walk away. <laughs> yeah, Mad Max. Um. So yeah. then there was George. <laughs> You're still going. Yeah. Keep going. So uh, George and I were like really good friends, and uh, we were going to move out here together. Oh. And we came out looking for a place, and he was dating a chick, and I think. I was manic as shit, but I think Shan. I was picking a lot of fights with Shannon while we were looking for places, and they were was like, "Was she out here too?" Yeah, and they were like, "They were like, uh, probably like we don't want to move in with them." Um, and so at the last minute, after spending, we only had like a week out here. I already we'd already given a notice at our apartment in Birmingham, at our jobs, and blah blah blah. And he was like, "Hey, I don't want to." I don't want to move in with you. Ooh. And I was just like, God damn it. And now granted, that was a shitty thing. Yeah. But I way overreacted. Uh, fucked up that friendship. Um, and then, uh, then who was next? <laughs> um, line up. Yeah. Line up, guys. Um, Mike and I. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, that was one. Also totally manic and being a dick. And then probably the... Oh, and then my friend James. James James and I were friends. He managed that nightclub I worked at. We were great friends. Um, and then uh, uh, t- had a fight about something that I don't remember what it was because the memory gaps. We didn't talk for years. Then his sister calls me and tells me he has throat cancer. Oh, Jesus. And so we go down to see him. He's staying with his mom at Port Wainimi. And uh, he can barely talk. He hadn't met my kids before, he, and we go out, and we're walking along the beach, and he has this uh, camera. He only shot film, and uh, he was taking pictures of birds, and he was teaching my my oldest kid, Wyatt, how to how to use the film camera and take pictures, and it was just such this nice thing. And uh, then we were like, we're going we're gonna to come back every Tuesday or whatever it was, you know? And the next week, the kids were really sick, and we were like, well, James has cancer. We don't want to bring sick kids in. And so we were going to come the next week after that, and he passed Ugh. before we could come. Ugh. And so that one stuck with me because it's yeah. like all the years that we lost because I fucked it up in mm. a manic state. Um, yeah. 
I think that's also something that kind of weighs on you, right? Is like time. Like I'm hyper aware of time. Like how much time we have, how much time you waste. You know, it's like you sit there and and you, you, I think that's one of the hardest things for me in terms of like taking care of my mental health is I feel like I'm wasting time. I feel like, I should be spending this time doing any other number of things. Instead of taking care of myself, I should be like experiencing a connection with my wife, a connection with my dog, an experience out with friends. And I I did that for a number of years, and that's part of what caused me to fucking mentally collapse. Yeah. You know? But but I still have that inclination of like I'm wasting time taking care of myself. Right? Yeah, because because a moment's like fucking that, like and that and that's fucking heartbreaking. I'm I'm sorry you went through that. I'm sorry your buddy James and you didn't reconnect sooner. And yeah, yeah, and you know that's the that's the bitch of this thing. Yeah, you know, is you you just destroy these relationships. You waste and, all this time. Yeah, and you know before I was diagnosed, I'd look back on some of these things and I'd be like, why did why did we get in a fight? Like I right. don't even understand it. And then I got diagnosed, and I was like. Oh, now I understand it. All of this makes sense. Oh, it was me. It was me. <laughs> it, was it was always all me. me. Yeah. It was always this broken thing. Um Yeah. There was Nikki who uh was like I don't think I've ever connected with somebody as strongly as I did Nikki and just like lied, to, like went to a manic state, like lied to her about like every fucking thing, every dumb little thing. Again, like these childish lies. Right. And because they're childish, like she knew I was lying. And she got really hurt and angry about it and um, uh, fucked that up. Um, and it's just, you know. And so I look back on all these people. And these were all people I loved. They were all people who were important to me and who I felt these, like, deep connections with. And the bipolar just fucking destroyed it. Just burn it all to the ground. Over and over again. And so, you know, like kind of you had hinted at earlier. It's like anytime I start to get close to someone now, I feel like they're going to hate me one day. Yeah. You know, Christy and I have been becoming good friends. Christy was on our CPTSD episode. Um, and I tell her that I'm like, you're going to see me manic one day and you're going to hate me. And she's like, no, because I know what it is. And I'm like, no, no. I know you're you're going to fucking hate me. Yeah. Like we're going to be friends for about six months. And you're going to see me manic and that's going to be it. Or I'm going to fucking disappear. I'm going to go into a depressive yeah, episode. And, and just ghost the shit ghost out the of you. I'm not responding to your text yeah. messages. and Which is what I did to her originally. Yeah. Like 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> fucking secular, bro. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I have a um, a group of people that I, I've started becoming close with. And I I don't want to lose. And I want to continue being connected with. And they're aware of my, you know, my my illness. And I think because of that, they give me a lot of a lot of lead way. But I'll be in like a group message with these people. There's like five or six of them and me. 35 messages will go by. Like, and I'm not talking about like rapid, rapid order where you're like, just shut the fuck up. I mean, like over the course of like two or three days, like 35 messages will go by. And people in this message group will say things because they're going through something or they'll want support for X, Y, and Z. And I will just not respond it's not because i don't see it it's not because i don't acknowledge it it's not even because i don't care it's you just can't i just can't and yeah. it's so frustrating it's, so what i've what i've tried to do is reach out separately start a new conversation just to acknowledge the fact that i'm thinking of them yeah does that make sense it's like yeah completely yeah you know it, and i think that i hope I hope that helps maintain the relationship. I don't know if it does, but I hope it does. I hope these people, you know, don't think that I'm ignoring them or I'm, I'm overlooking their problems or minimalizing what they're going through. Cause that's not the case. It's not, it's. Well, and like you said, it's, it's strange to tell people about this because some people, and you never know which reaction you're going to get from who. Some people will understand and be empathetic. 
uh, about what you're going through if they know you're bipolar. And then other people, that immediately makes them run for the hills. Sure. Well, something else to think about is, let's say someone you tell someone you're bipolar, does that affect the type of relationship they want to have with you if they understand what bipolar is? Right. right. Do they want to get close to you? Do they all? want to? Or do, yeah. do they do they reevaluate the closeness they thought they had with you? Yeah. And then walls start going up. That will yeah. never come down. Yeah. And it's tough, you know. You hope you hope that when people see these states in you that they can understand, they can accept it. And it's weird, like for me, I feel like I get more sympathy out of a depression than oh, the mania. Oh, you definitely because the mania makes me an asshole. Oh yeah, totally. I'm a manipulative, self absorbed cocksucker when I'm manic. And that's harder yeah, yeah, to yeah. forgive. When you're manic. <laughs> yeah only when only I'm when you're mad only when i'm mad um <laughs> fuck you <laughs> but uh but when you're depressed you know I, I feel like people can have more sympathy for that oh definitely um but you know i mean that's again what i tell christy like i i love christy to pieces um and she's been so wonderful she's seen me depressed since we've become friends again and she's so there and she's so supportive. But she hasn't seen me manic. You know, the only the only manic episode I talked to her was the one that didn't work out like the other manic episodes that I talk about on Brad Interrupted, where it's like I just felt sick and wrong. Right. Which, again, is easy to be sympathetic toward. But, you know, what happens when I go into that state where I'm like lying my ass off to her about stupid shit? Showing up naked like, to parties. Yeah. yeah. Or like yelling at her about something that is very trivial. Or smacking a lamp across the room, you know. I don't know what it is with me and lamps. You I've hate lamps. A, I've done that a you lot. You hate them. It's fucking lamps. I mean, I, I get it. Lamps. I get it. You know why? Because they have a shade. They're hiding something. That's right. They're That's fucking right. hiding something. Lamps. <laughs> fuck you, lamps. That's how I feel about you, lamps. <laughs> I seriously, I joke, but I've done that multiple times in the <laughs> states. For some reason, I smack lamps across the room. Fucking lamps. <laughs> fucking and it scares you. the shit out of people. Fucking hate you, lamps. <laughs> Uh, let me talk about our sponsor, fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, John's lamp barn. John's lamp barn. <laughs> lamps, lamps, lamps. Uh, John's lamp barn. We've got all your lamp needs. I hope the friends of ours that are listening to us do this. Take a moment and recognize the fact that you're in our life for a reason. And you've been in our life for a longer period of time than many people have. You know, I haven't established a lot of short-term short-term relationships in a while. Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but I think maybe it's because I'm older now. I don't look for that immediate connection like I used to. That kind of like, uh, maybe because I have closer friends. Yeah. But the people in our lives who we care about that are friends of ours that are listening to this, I just want to say thank you because I know it can't be easy all the time being friends with us. God knows it cannot. No. Um, and, you know, that's uh, when I get down on myself, because we've talked about this, you go into these depressed states or the mixed feature states or even just sometimes when you're feeling guilty about this shit, this stuff. And you sit around and you're like, God, what a fucking piece of shit I am for all the shit I've done mm. and all these these people I love that I hurt. And that's something that I I try to remind myself is that there are people who see that side of us and still stick around, which means there's got to be something wonderful about us. I hope so. And As, besides our looks, yeah, yeah, because I mean, Danny DeVito, yeah, Danny DeVito. <laughs> Twins, Danny. Yeah, yeah, twins. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Young, strapping Danny Young DeVito. Young, strapping Danny DeVito. <laughs> I made that joke to somebody in an email, and I found a picture of him in, like, a wrestling singlet from what, from Always Sunny. <laughs> and it included that. I was like, that's, like my, that's my, that's crazy, my Crazy, like, hair. <laughs> like, clown uh, hair. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, so I called out on the friendships I ruined. I, I want to take a second. And call out the people who have been super supportive of me. Uh, Adam, obviously. Uh, Shannon. 
John Patrizzi, uh, Rusty, Banner, Maggie, Andy, Kurt, um, Catherine. God, my my friend Catherine, I like we hadn't talked in ages, and when I got diagnosed, she immediately was like, "Hey, uh, come over, let's go for a walk." And then, like, you know, she'll just hit me up out of the blue and be like, hey, let's get coffee. And then, you know, hey, let's go to a movie. And, like, makes me get out of the house and do shit. Um, and I appreciate that so much. Christy, I, I, I honestly don't even know if I'd be here right now if it wasn't for Christy. Um, and, you know, these these relationships, they mean so much to have people support you with all this. Um, because it is fucking hard as hell. You fight and you fight and you fight. And it's exhausting. I am so tired. All yeah. The time. I'm so, you know, I, I'm so tired of being tired. Yeah. Like I, I've never had, we've talked about this before. I've never had a suicidal thought, which is unfortunately common with bipolar. But I totally get it. Yeah. I get why somebody would get to the point where they're like, I'm so tired. I can't do this. I'm anymore. tired of fighting. Yeah tired of fighting yeah but you can't give up you can't give up because you know how we've talked about that idea of like i want to stop taking my medicine because that makes me weak right or i don't want to ask for help because that makes me weak the ultimate weakness is giving up yeah that's you know i want you to think about that when you consider going off your meds first just fucking ending it all man like you know what the true weakness is is not trying your hardest trying every possible option like work really work yeah really try if the work you're doing now isn't isn't helping change it change it find something else change your meds change your type of therapy there are so many types of therapy there's so many types there don't give up like giving up that's giving up is weak don't give up yeah and you know what? None of you will because you're batshit badasses. You're batshit badasses. And you're trying. The fact that you're listening to this screams that you're trying. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know yeah. Yeah. what's going on and you want to fight it. Yeah. And you want to you want to broaden the community around you to with people that have experienced it. And you want to like bounce ideas off of folk and relate stories and say, yeah, me too. And that's, that's huge. Yeah. It's and, huge. And you know what? Like bringing it back to the topic of the show – you probably want to do that because you have people in your life you care about. Yep, exactly. And you want them to, you don't want to hurt them anymore. And you want them to care about you. Yep. And you want to establish deep, meaningful relationships, not just surface level BS. Yeah. Yeah. So do that, please. Find those people that understand you or that are willing to go on this journey with you, relate to them, try and connect with them. And once you do, don't give up on it and don't accept the fact that this is just going to end, so why fucking try? Like, put the effort in because you have to work to maintain relationships too. Like, it's not it's not easy. It's not one-sided. It's All of it is work. Yeah. So keep fighting. Keep trying. Find the people who love you and hold on to them for all, all you got. Even when they're like, please let me go. Nope, You're nope, like, no, 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 no. Come here. There's a reason you're in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, just, you know, make sure you soundproof those windows. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's all we're saying. Million, you know? <laughs> uh, John's soundproofing is available. <laughs> we see you. We love you. Keep fighting.